So, kind of how to, how do I present it? I didn't even know how, but the question is, or the topic is the concept of present truth, right? So, simple question, what is the concept of present truth and why is it important? <clears throat> As we, um, present truth is the principle that certain biblical truths are relevant to God's people at specific times in history. Simple, right? It's simple. God sends the Holy Spirit to reveal truth that help us better understand how to interpret and apply His Word in current events. Turn on the news. Like I, was, I always keep telling you, I don't, uh, it's really hard, but I've turned off the news. I don't even listen to the news no more on the radio or anything going on it's, uh, and what's going on in the Middle East and all this. And whatever's going on in the world, I turn it off and, and, and it allows you to be more focused on God's Word. Um, because you're trying to apply what's going on in the world and you try to bring it into what's happening in the Bible, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. What you need to do is read your Bible and then look at the world. It makes more sense. Yeah. And though this concept isn't solely Adventist, it does play a large role in the... And I cry, how? Bible students, how did present truth play a role in the midnight cry? To you. To me, the role present truth played in the midnight cry, if you were alive in those times, you knew that some great event was going to take place. Why? Prophecy. Because of prophecy. Right. Exactly. Right. What prophecy? 2300 day prophecy. You had something was going to take place that they were aware of back then that the sanctuary was about to be cleansed. Right? So great things were about to take place according to the prophecy. So, and though this concept isn't solely Adventist, it does a play, lar a play a large role in the midnight cry. So you know, the midnight cry was not Adventist. It was worldwide. It was through all faiths. From Catholic faiths to Buddhist faith, everybody was waiting for something. And the church that came out of this present truth movement was... Seventh-day Adventist. So what is present truth? And where does the idea come from? And what are some examples? This will, that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to look at some examples of present truth in the Bible. And why is this concept so important to the Adventist church today? I'm not talking about the structure. I'm talking about the people who believe in this message. Okay? So where does the concept of present truth come from? It says, this is a biblical belief that God reveals specific truth during specific time period for a specific purpose. Right? Like in Daniel. Remember what Daniel uh, uh, 12 says, verse 8? And I heard, but I understood not. Then said, I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And what was the response? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So can you imagine Daniel being given specific uh, uh, visions? And he said, it's not for you to understand today. Yeah. Seal up the book because it's for the people of the time of the? Yeah. How many years future? 2,300 years later. Wow. Right? Question for you. Do we have any time prophecies that we are to look forward to? No more time prophecies. According to what chapter in the Bible? Revelation 10. Revelation 10. Said by who? Jesus through John. Jesus through John, right? Presented as an angel standing in the water and on the sea. Raising his right hand towards heaven and saying what? There shall be time no longer. Right? We read... As the world changes and as time changes, God will send the Holy Spirit to us to help us understand how we live out the present truth of the Bible. In that way, Scripture is both timeless and always on time. I'll give you an example. It is timeless because the Bible is full of truth that apply to us regardless of time and place and culture. 
But it is timely in that it can speak directly to the circumstances of a specific time and place. Like what happened in New England. When? In the early 1800s and the late 1700s. And we're going to study that on Thursday. Bible studies. We're going to get to that. This doesn't mean the truth of the Bible that made an impact in a certain context don't apply to us today. Rather, they might apply to us in different ways. Like an example, Jesus going to the cross. Is that present truth? Or is it truth that already took place? It's truth that already took place. Yeah. But does it apply and affect us today? Yes. Yes, it does. Most definitely. You see, it's important to note that God's word does not change, right? For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. New truths are always consistent with other truths in the Bible. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, the present truth, which is a test to the people of this generation, was not a test to the people of generations far back. Can you give me an example? Anybody? Um, the, the flood is coming. The flood is coming. Very good one. The one. We're going to talk about that. That's always the number one topic. Yeah, Noah. Right? The sanctuary being cleansed. You know, things that don't. Right? So you have to understand what present truth is. I'll give you an example to me what present truth is. Present truth to me is light. Right? You know how you get a flashlight? And you put, you make a big spot. As long as you stand in that light, right? That's present truth. But if the light starts moving, do you follow it? Yes. You follow it. If you don't, you're going to left, be left in what? Darkness. 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 Present truth is present truth. And not future truth. And the word as a lamp shines brightly where we stand and not so plainly on the path in the distance. So, can you give me an example today of what we're looking forward to, which is soon to be present truth? Sunday law. Sunday law. Very simply. Sunday law, right? Right. How about, uh, uh, which one? How, yeah, Daniel 11. Daniel 11.45, right? We are on the brinks of that. And, and uh, one that I've been pondering a lot lately is the hail, um, hailstones that are going to be uh, at the weight of 100 talents. Is that, what it, is that correct? That's present. So um, my next question is, the verse that gives us the phrase present truth, where did we find it? Anybody know? Thank you. Yeah, Second Peter. Second Peter, one verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to you, always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Can you tell me what was the present truth in Peter's time? A risen Savior, right? A risen Savior. And we know it as the early rain going out and the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. Gentiles. So we looked at we asked, what are some examples of present truth in the Bible? Noah's warning of the flood, right? God commanded Noah to build an ark because there was going to be a worldwide flood. Noah listened to God's message for him. Uh, for him. He built an ark, and he and his family and the ark full of animals were saved. The warning of the flood was present truth for Noah and his family, but not for us today. What do we have today? From that present truth over 4,000 years ago. Yeah, we are. No, the present truth that we have today is all the evidence that it took place. Evidence, when you drive and you look, everywhere you look, there's evidence of a flood. Everywhere you look. Everywhere you look. It's just been disguised by learned men to give it another title or another cause of why these things happen. So they're, just, they're hiding the evidence, but it's out there. How about Paul's message to the Jews and the Gentiles? Remember that? 
After the death and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel spread to the people in all the surrounding areas, Jews and Gentiles alike. But Jewish members of the early Christian church struggled to understand the gospel and once again upheld their traditions and ceremonies above it. They began imposing these traditions on the non-Jewish members of the church too. Paul had present truth to give to the early church. In his letter to the Galatians in the New Testament, he wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, and there is neither male nor or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. And if the Christian nations today would understand this present truth, there wouldn't be such an emphasis or focus on what? Jerusalem, Israel. We wouldn't have that problem. The problem that we would be facing if they understood this is how do we bring Christ to the Jews in Israel? And how do we bring Christ to the Muslim nations? You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ wasn't meant for only one group of people. It was meant for all people. Amen. Amen. Right? Yep. Now I want to get, I didn't want to spend too much time on this. But this is where we get to, um, I want to say the meat of what I want to talk about today. And we won't spend a lot of time on it. And unto the church of the Laodiceans. We read, I know thy works. Is this present truth? Yes. We're going to look at present truth. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So what does it mean to be spewed out of his mouth as stated? Reject it. Any other ones? Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, along the same lines as the father being angry in the parable, um, just to be disgusted. To be disgusted, I like that. And when someone is rejected and someone is disgusted by these actions, what happens? This is what happens. The figure of spewing out of his mouth means that he cannot offer up your prayers or your expressions of love to God. Yeah. I want to stop right here. Lately, uh, something's been talking to me. Again, I've been listening to this young uh, black gentleman speaking, giving the gospel. Sam has been sharing videos with me. And, and, and one of the things that really, really struck to me, he said, God... <coughs> pays or has your whole undivided attention. And the way he put it was, was that all his thoughts about you in a, in a single given day or a moment, not even all the grains of sand and all the oceans or under the sea can fulfill how much thought he puts into you as an individual. Amen. That got me to think, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say it, but when I'm sitting here, what we need to do is we need to close our minds. Not our minds, but we need to close our thought pattern and act as if though this sermon pertains just to me alone. Amen. This message is for me. Right? And when we read, is this me? Can this be talking about me? Because she goes on to say, he cannot endorse your teachings of his word or your spiritual work in any wise. Why? Because we are neither hot nor cold. And he cannot present your religious experience with the request that grace be given you. Isn't that amazing? So what is it about this Laodicean state that causes this to take place? In Bible Commentary, Volume 7, we read, Our Father in Heaven so loved this world that He gave Jesus to us as our Mediator and Savior. And this is the key. This is the key with the issue of the Laodicean state. A mediator is a go-between. If, 
because you have continually failed or refused to walk in the light of his word and have no repentance and sorrow for sin and no turning away from the ways of this world, then you will be spewed out of his mouth. He cannot present their case to the Father. If they realized that they were sinners, he could plead in their behalf and the Lord would arouse him by his Holy Spirit. But they are worse than dead in trespasses and sins. They hear the word, but make no application of it to themselves. Instead, they apply the word spoken to their neighbors. This is not talking about me. This is talking about somebody I've seen in church do this. I do that too. It's talking about somebody else. It's not talking about me. You know? This is not talking about me. Why? Because I know I'm walking in the truth. I know I am in need of nothing, right? I have all the truth. God is working with me. But who is he talking to? To all of us. He's talking to us all. But it's going to get deeper than that. Should we say we have all the truth that our pioneers had? We don't want any more. Should God send a message as he did to Nineveh? What would be the result? The same as would have resulted to the Ninevites if they had not repented. Sentence was pronounced upon them, but their repentance saved them. How thankful we should be that we have a God who will repent of the threatened evil when the erring return to him with true contrition of soul. Now, why is the principle of present truth important to the Adventist church? Because so many of our foundational doctrines, including the Sabbath, salvation by faith, Jesus, role in the heavenly sanctuary, and the three angels' messages were discovered as God gave new revelations during the midnight cry and sincere Bible study. You know what I didn't mention there? Anybody can tell me what I didn't mention there? The truth about God. Why didn't I mention it there? I didn't mention it there because it wasn't an issue during the first 50 years of the pioneers' gospel. It wasn't an issue. Most people knew the truth about God. Because of present truth, Adventism is what it is today. Let's look at some present truth messages from God. As time passes and we get closer and closer to the end of this world and the second coming of Jesus, we may receive more present truth from God. He may reveal things to us in the scriptures that we didn't see before. I believe that. Can I give you an example of one? This is just for me. Whenever I read the third angel's message and I saw the judgments that were being brought upon those who had the mark of the beast as being uh, uh, tormented with fire and brimstone, I always put that where? After the second coming. But as we have been studying and looking and seeing how the world is going on, it tells me that the fire and brimstone is going to be when? When the mark of the beast is given. When the mark of the beast is issued, you will be tormented with fire and brimstone here and in near now. It's not going to be something after the second coming. It's going to be while we are alive and we are who and what we are today. But we can have faith in God that he will reveal truth to us when it is time for those truths to be revealed. Through studying the scriptures and discussing with each other, we can stay attuned to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and always be growing in our spiritual walk with our Savior. You see, God is bringing his people together, those that are studying his word. He's bringing us together. You know why? Because God, I really love our, 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 um, our Thursday Bible studies, especially Revelation. I studied the Revelation on my own and, and, it, and, it, and God spoke to me on a personal state. But when we have us together and we're all given our input of what God has revealed to all of us, I am so blessed because I am learning just from listening and hearing how God has spoken differently, personally, to each individual there. So it's important not to forsake yourselves from assembling together. Now, 
agreement with prior revelation. There is a difference. There's a book out there. It's called Heralds of a uh, New Light, and it was written in 1987. I just took a few excerpts from it, only because it's on the it's on the White Estate uh, webpage. But it's entitled Agreement with Prior Revelation. There is a difference between new light and contradiction with old light. New light is information that goes beyond that which was provided by earlier prophets, but does not contradict it. Amen. Amen? Amen. You see, several years ago, in an Adventist college student, an Adventist college student who was serving as a student missionary in Indonesia became disenchanted with Ellen White and her writings. Eventually, he left the church. In a Here I Stand manifesto, which he sent to his former associates in Southeast Asia, the young man cited as one of the reasons for abandoning Ellen White that she taught things that were not in the Bible. Has anybody ever had this thought? I did. I read so many things in the spirit of prophecy that are not in the Bible. Why would you not have a, not an issue with it, but why would you not know that Ellen White wrote many things that are not written in the Bible? Of course she does, it stated. The New Testament writers provide information not found in the Old Testament too. Did you know that? Can anybody tell me what's in the New Testament that's not written in the Old Testament? Can someone give me an example? How about Jude in the battle for the body of Moses? Do you find that in the Old Testament? No. How about when Paul cites the names of Pharaoh sorcerers that were battling against Moses? They're named in the New Testament. You don't find them in the Old Testament. Many things. So is Ellen Wright any different? It's the same spirit. You see, this young man failed to recognize a significant distinction between extra biblical teachings, in other words, information not explicitly found in Scripture, and anti biblical teachings, those that are contrary to what is taught in Scripture. There's a difference. A careful examination of the writings of Alan White on the subject of new light suggests two points worth noting. One, new light will continue to come to God's people who are willing to study and search for truth. Amen? Amen. And two, new light never disagrees with old light. Amen. Is there anything in the spirit of prophecy that disagrees with the Bible? No. Not in my understanding. Not in anything that I have ever read in the writings of Ellen White has it ever contradicted the Bible. And I love reading the Spirit of Prophecy. And I love reading the Bible. If a new prophet never gave us anything beyond that which had already been revealed, then he would simply be restating old truth, and a non prophet can do that just as well. You see, let it be said loud and clear that a number of the ideas that have floated around in Adventism during the past half dozen or so years, highly touted as new light, are neither new, they have been voiced by others over the years, nor are they light. Can anybody tell me simply what has crept into the church that is not new light? The Trinity. The Trinity. The Trinity, what does it do? It rejects that Jesus is the literal Son of God. And it rejects the old light. And it rejects the old light, exactly. Yes. It rejects the old light. Those are the things. It that, says that those people of that time that believed that light were deceived. Wow. Really, if you come right down to it. Yes, amen, yeah. Yep. I couldn't disagree. That's... That, I couldn't agree more. So unless tragically, it was light that had gone out in darkness, and that's exactly what happened as reading stated. Isaiah taught us how to distinguish between new light. And what is that? And that which is more near counterfeit? 
Remember, we talked about it last time I was up here. He said, to the law and to the testimony, he said, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And the Trinity, do you find a Trinity in the sanctuary message? No, you don't. No, you don't. Jesus added the final uh, uh, postscript when he told Nicodemus that the ultimate condemnation was not that men were in moral and spiritual darkness. He said the condemnation was rather that when genuine light came along, men chose to remain in darkness rather than follow the light to truth and salvation. We need to pray in our conversation that we had, we need to pray for those who have these big ministries but are still in darkness when it comes to the issue on the truth about God. That's right. I have learned, and I expressed this last time, I have learned something that I no longer want to be involved or read or look at anything that any of these writers who do not accept the truth about God teach or write. If you reject this light, what happens to the light when it moves? You stay in darkness. If you stay in darkness, what are you writing in darkness? Think about that. Is the truth about God new light? No. no. Regan made a, a statement this morning on, in um, Sabbath school about Jesus and the Sanhedrin and, and the rejection of the truth back then. We'll get into that in a little bit. But I do want to share something about all these great speakers and all these great teachers that are out there who are rejecting this light. And it has to do with the 144,000, right, who have their father's name written in their foreheads. How are they going to have their name written in their forehead if they are not they which follow the Lamb where the, wheresoever he goeth? And what is the Lamb? And Christ said he is the truth, the way, truth, the way and, the, and the light. To reject this truth, yes, brother. No, go ahead. No, to reject this truth is to reject Jesus. Go ahead. How can you have the Father's name in your forehead as the God you worship when that's not the God you worship? Very good point. And I didn't even think about that one. How can you have the Father's name written if... The God that you worship is not the God of the Trinity. That's right. Or the Trinity God is not the God of the Bible. It's not the same God. So I know when we look at this, I'm, I'm closing up now. As we look at this light, that's just a symbolic of light, right? But that's not Christ. But rejecting light. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, he said. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. What is light? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. See why I love the desire of ages? She points it out. I mean, what is light? Jesus. Hmm? Jesus. And what is Jesus? Son of God. And when you have Jesus and the Son of God and you have the light, you have what? You have life. You have life. What kind of life? Eternal, Eternal. Eternal life. What happens if you reject this light? And what is this light that I'm speaking of? Have not life. The truth. If you're rejecting Jesus, you're rejecting the truth about God. Right? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Still going, we're still in the Laodicean uh, 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 present truth condition. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. Remember we talked about glory? You see, 2 Thessalonians, we read, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. 
that they might be saved. I used to always say, they don't want to receive the truth about the Sabbath. They don't want to receive the truth about all these truths. But the truth is, let me put it to you how I see it. Prior to the knowledge of the truth about God, and I didn't even, and to tell the truth, I didn't even know what it was I believed. But to me, brother, the truth was that Sunday law was coming and the Sabbath was the thing that was going to draw the line. But how can you draw a line in the sand when you're not even worshiping the true God and you're worried about the fourth commandment and you're worshiping other gods? Is, if you're here worshiping other gods, having other gods before him as a trinity, will the Sabbath be an issue for you? No. It will not. It will not. Because you're already breaking other commandments. If you break one, you've broken how many? All. You've broken them all. And for this cause, God shall send them, send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And they do. They do believe lies. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. And who is the truth? Jesus, right? But had pleasure in unrighteousness. In John we read, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. When Jesus, after his 40 days in the wilderness, when he came down, he came down and where did he go to? He went to the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible describes that when he found them, how did he find everybody? In darkness. What is Darkness. You're going to see the absence of light. But what is really darkness in this context? The absence of life. The absence of truth. What is the absence of truth? Lies, deception. What is the absence of life? Death. When Genesis 1, we talked about this before. What's the first thing when God created the heavens and the earth and... God, what was the first thing he said? Let there be? Life. Let there be life and let there be truth. To begin with. Because there was nothing but darkness there. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We are, and, 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 and the way I can explain this is, however we are here on the Sabbath should be the same way we are wherever we may be. Amen? Sin lies at the door of those who do not allow their ignorance to be expelled by the rays of light from God's word. Did you hear that? In other words, when we go to these people and we give them the truth about God and they still reject it, we need to pray for them. Maybe they're not ready for it. But in the end, will it be excused? They are doing what the Jews did in the days of Christ. Teaching for the doctrines of the commandments of men, by their actions they say, we do not wish to be disturbed. Let us alone. Do not disturb our peace. To God's messenger said to them with words of warning and reproof, they say, Thou art, art thou he that troubleth Israel? And in 11 manuscript, we, believe, we read, The light of truth is shining upon us as clearly as it shone upon the Jewish people. But the hearts of men are as hard and unimpressionable as in the days of Christ. Because they know not what they oppose. Did you hear that? When those who have accepted this um, idolatry, trinity, when you present to them the truth about God, they oppose it. Do you know that they don't even know what it is that they are opposing? They don't know. Because if they knew then there will be no sacrifice for them. <clears throat> Many who claim to be standing in the light are in darkness and know it not. 
They have so enshrouded themselves in unbelief that they call darkness light and light darkness. They are ignorant of that which they condemn and oppose. Now, very quickly, I just want to take you back to the desire of ages as she describes Jesus before Caiaphas. We read, at last, Caiaphas, raising his right hand toward heaven, addressed Jesus in the form of a solemn oath. I adjure you. What does that word adjure mean? To you. I, I command you. In other words, I'm telling you. In other words, I'm telling thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ. What is that? The Son of God. To this appeal, Christ could not remain silent. There was a time to be silent and a time to speak. He knew that to answer now would make his death certain. But the appeal was made by the highest acknowledgement authority of the nation and in the name of the Most High. And that last paraphrase is the leal, the same state. <clears throat> What are the leaders of this church movement doing? The exact same thing that Caiaphas did. How? By rejecting the truth about God. We read, Christ would not fail to show proper respect for the law. More than this, his own relation to the Father was called in question. Isn't that amazing? History is repeating itself. He must plainly declare his character and mission. Every ear was bent to listen. Every eye was fixed upon his face as he answered, Thou hast said. A heavenly light seemed to illuminate his pale countenance as he added, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Who is this power that he spoke of? His father. All power was given unto Christ by who? His father. His father. And where is, he, where is Jesus going to be sitting at? After the crucifixion. In the right hand of the father. Where? In the heavenly sanctuary. And he continues to say, you will also see him coming in the clouds of heaven. Going on, he goes, but their ignorance is not such as God will excuse coming back to the times of today. What we call present truth. Those who reject this truth, they will not be excused because of ignorance. Why is that? Because for he has given them light and they reject it. They have before them the example of the past and we just looked at it. But they will not be warned and unbelief is enclosing them in an impenetrable darkness they refuse to accept the testimonies they ought to believe and are ready to accept tablets of gossip and testimonies of men showing their credulousness and readiness to believe that which they want to believe isn't that sad what is present truth to you today do you understand how present truth works See, things are moving so fast, so fast in the days that we're living today. That light is just moving quicker. Now we have to step it up. You have to keep up with the light. I want to close with these thoughts right here. For we were once in darkness, but now we are, what's that word? Light. We are light. In the Lord, walk as the children of light. Why? Christ said to his disciples, we are the light of the world. As the sun goes forth in the heavens to fill the world with brightness, so must the followers of Jesus shed the light of truth upon those who are going in the darkness of error and superstition. What does that word superstition mean to you? Anybody have any? What is superstition? 
Believe in things that are not so? Ideas, concept? I think the Trinity falls into probably the most superstitious idea that doesn't make any sense. It didn't make sense to me then. And it didn't even make sense to me when it was presented to me in the form of the Godhead, just a different title. It didn't make sense to me, but I left it alone. But we read. This is important. What does it say? But Christ followers have no light of themselves. Isn't that right? Why? Because it is the light of heaven that falls upon them, which is to be reflected by them to the world. And God's people said? Amen. So, (coughs) present truth today (laughs) is moving ever so quickly. Ever so quickly.